physical geology students and this is the first video for your Wednesday lecture on June the 24th we're gonna finish chapter 5 first and then we're gonna go on to chapter 7 which is geologic time um, we left off talking about sedimentary structures and sedimentary structures um, are useful in determining the depositional environment of where the sedimentary rocks formed. Next one we want to talk about is mud cracks. Here's some pictures of mud cracks from Maryland. And I'm sure you've seen mud cracks before if you've been outdoors, you've seen them. Have you ever seen something like this? Mud cracks? I saw that you I saw you yawn. Mud cracks are not boring. Mud cracks are exciting. When I first saw mud cracks, I could not sleep at night. <laughs> uh, so anyway, mud, what do mud cracks indicate? Mud cracks form in mud, which is made of clay, and they indicate that conditions became dry that water evaporated out, leaving behind mud cracks. Here's some actual mud cracks. And mud cracks are preserved in the rock record. They get filled up with sediment and they become rock, usually shale or siltstone. Um, so when you find mud cracks, what depositional environment uh, would you think of? You think of a, a of a lake that has dried up, or a tidal flat. What is a tidal flat? Well, for those of you who haven't been along the coast a lot, uh, sometimes you have beaches along the coast, but sometimes you have mud flats where you, instead of having a sandy beach, you have mud along the coastline, and then when um, this water, the seawater evaporates, that can leave behind mud cracks as well. Another sedimentary structure is raindrop impressions. I'm sure you've seen these before. Um, when it rains, it leaves little bump, uh, little impressions in the mud. And that's real useful if you think about it because that means that that rock formed on the land not in the ocean not in a river but on the land so here we have a whole bunch of depositional environments you can see here and whenever you look at a sedimentary rock as a geologist your your job is to figure out where did that rock where was that sediment that made up that sedimentary rock, where did it form? Where was it deposited? Deposited? Was it deposited in a shallow marine environment, shallow ocean, or was it formed in the deep ocean, such as with graded bedding, or in a lake, or in a lagoon, or on a beach, on a river delta? Um, or was it formed as a sand dune, or maybe in a glacial area, like with glacial till? Or alluvial fan. What is an alluvial fan? Well, an alluvial fan is something you may not have seen unless, if you've gone out west, you've seen this. If you've gone out to the southwestern part of the United States, you've seen alluvial fans. And this is what they look like. Um, and they form along the edges of desert mountains. It, it, you have a lot of creeks and rivers out west that are that only flow a few days a year when it rains and when it rains there's not a lot of vegetation to hold the soil in so you get these mudslides that come off of the uh, desert mountains and form these alluvial fans alluvial fans you're going to have coarser sediment that's deposited out first because it's heavier and the finer grain stuff moves out and it has a sort of lobate shape. So um, that's another depositional environment of the alluvial fan.
this shows you some common rock types and where they form. Chert and flint uh, form in the deep ocean. That's what abyssal means. Um, a reef deposit might uh, get preserved as a limestone with fossils in it, especially coral fossils. Those corals make up most reefs. Shale might form in a lagoon or a lake, and they'll be laminated. That means they'll have thin layers, very thin layers in it, in each, in each bed. You see conglomerate and sandstone can be formed in a river, by a river. Coal was formed in a swamp, etc. So, when you see this word abyssal in your textbook, don't be, don't be confused by it. That means deep ocean. Chert and flint are made up of tiny little creatures. Like, let me show you what they look like. They're called diatoms. And look how beautiful these things are. The little animal lives inside of these microscopic shells. But microscopic shells, we have a special word for it. We call them tests. And these creatures are, are what you call plankton, the most abundant form of life on planet Earth. In a gallon of seawater, you might have hundreds of thousands of these little microscopic creatures. But all that gets preserved are their tests. They fall to the bottom and they make up your chert and your flint because their, their tests are made of quartz. Another creature that uh, is found, their tests are found in um, chert and flint are these creatures called radiolarians. You can see them, they got spikes on them like this, probably for protection. They float in the water, very small. Uh, they're, they're microscopic creatures and they filter out the water and they, when these di radiolarians and diatoms fall to the ocean bottom um, they collect on the deep ocean floor and they make up chert and flint beaches, don't forget beaches are well sorted sands sometimes you're going to have some um, a river delta maybe get preserved if the river is flowing uh, directly onto a beach and adding sand to the beach. We talked about tidal flats where you have mud or which is clay or silt along a coastline and sometimes these uh, indication that you're dealing with tidal flats is you're dealing with um, silt stones and shales uh, with mud cracks. Reefs. Um, I don't know if you've ever been on a cruise, but I'm sure some of y'all have been on a cruise. And, and when you go on carnival cruises or um, Royal Caribbean or whatever you go with, you'll see these beautiful coral reefs and you can go scuba diving. Here's the corals here. These get preserved in limestones. So when you find coral reef deposits, um, that means that the water was uh, warm, shallow, sunlit, and clear. Where in the world do you find warm, shallow, clear, sunlit ocean water, seawater? Think of the Florida Keys or the Bahamas. Think of the Caribbean, my favorite part of the world. Corals cannot survive in cold water. They can't because cold, cold water will kill them. The little animals live inside of these corals and they precipitate out this these calcium carbonate little bo um, uh, parts of the coral reef. So inside of this little blue thing here you might find uh, 30 or 40 polyps. Polyps are the little creatures that live inside of each of these and these large colonies. And um, they get preserved in the rock record. The, the name for these are synidria in Latin. 
Sanidria fossils in limestone. Now you find these in Tennessee, by the way. Uh, here you can see this is a tip. Uh, this one here is a, um, a typical coral. This one's not colonial; it's solitary. The animal lived right here, in here. The male or the female did. They do sexual reproduction. Here's a colonial one. Each one of these lived a little polyp. You find these all around Tennessee. What's that tell you about Tennessee? We find coral reefs, uh, cor uh, synidria inside of limestones in eastern Tennessee that are between 350 and 390 million years old. What's that tell, tell you? It tells you that East Tennessee was covered by seawater 350 to 390 million years ago. And it was a Bahamas-like environment where warm, shallow, clear, sunlit waters covered up much of Tennessee a long time ago. In historical geology, we talk about that more. This is what we call a lagoon. And here, this is the coastline, so this is the ocean. And then you have a strip of sand separating the lagoon from the open ocean. Uh, lagoons are areas where there's very low energy, there's no currents flowing in through, so that fine-grained sediment collects on the bottom. So lagoons are usually preserved as things like uh, shale or siltstone, and a certain uh, fossils are going to be found in there. Sometimes you have creeks or rivers that flow into the lagoon, so you have this water that is less salty than the open ocean, and certain creatures prefer that, such as uh, oysters and blue crab, and those could get preserved in the rock record. So what you want to do when you pick up a sedimentary rock is always look for fossils, because fossils are going to tell you a lot about the depositional environment, what type of creatures were living in there. Do I find freshwater fossils in there, in this rock, or do I find saltwater creatures? And if they are saltwater creatures, do they live in the deep ocean or in the shallow ocean? And do I find any synidria, corals? Uh, or instead, maybe you find freshwater creatures in, in that sedimentary rock, telling you that that was an ancient lake, for example. Or did it form on the land? Is the, if there's footprints of any kind, that means you're on the land. Here's a delta. It's the Nile Delta. Here's the Nile River. It flows uh, from south to north, and you can see that this uh, is uh, got a lot of vegetation here. Almost all of the agricultural output from the country of Egypt comes from the Nile Delta. The rest of it is mostly desert. These deltas get preserved in the rock record. And they form these fan-shaped deposits, such as the Mississippi River flowing into the Gulf of Mexico, uh, or any river that you might think of that flows into an ocean or a lake. Can make a standing body of water can make a delta, and so you're going to find lots of fossils in deltaic deposits. And um, the important thing about finding ancient delta deposits is, since they have so much biological activity. They are amongst the best sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks formed in uh, a deltaic depositional environment are some of the best sedimentary rocks for finding oil and natural gas. Just to give you an example, the, you know the Mississippi River flows into the Gulf of Mexico. Rivers change course so that we have ancient deltas that... ExxonMobil has found um, in the Gulf of Mexico. There are five different ancient deltas showing the path that the Mississippi River took over the last 6,000 years, and it's changed course six times over the last 6,000 years. Well, why is ExxonMobil and BP so interested in finding these ancient deltas? They're filled with oil and natural gas. The six deltas that were formed by the Mississippi over the last 6,000 years have been tapped for tens of billions of dollars of oil and natural gas by ExxonMobil. So if you're an oil geologist, you, you want to find, you want to know about this depositional environment called a delta. Rivers form certain types of deposits. 
usually sandstone and conglomerate. And a conglomerate is a real common sedimentary rock, the trital sedimentary rock formed by a river or a creek. A creek just is smaller than a river. And as the pebbles move downstream, they get more and more rounded and more and more equant. So you can actually tell where were you on that river? Were you up near the headwaters where the river began? Or were you down near the mouth? The, se the sediments that are deposited near the mouth, especially at a river delta, are going to be smoother and more equant. Whereas those upstream are going to be more elongate and rough. Lake systems form uh, since you have very little water current in a lake, you're going to form lots of mud, which is uh, clay, which will become shale, and silt, which will become siltstone. You're going to have these thin layers inside of each bed. Those are uh, called laminations uh, associated with lake deposits. Glacial deposits. Uh, much of our planet is covered by ice. About 10% of the Earth's land mass is covered by ice. This is Canada up here. And you can see that the ice will dump out sediments. And the sediments are going to be poorly sorted because they didn't travel very far. They just got dumped out by the ice. And that's called glacial till, T-I-L-L. -L. Often a time, the boulders and gravel are, and sand are going to be rougher and more elongate because they haven't traveled a great distance. Okay, there's your sedimentary rocks, and now, um, without further ado, we're going to go into Chapter 7, Geologic Time. Okay, uh, for those of you who have had historical geology, you know something about geologic time. Um, for, those, for those of you who this is your first geology class, I'll just tell you, geologists do not think about time the same way as the ordinary person does. What do, I mean, what do I mean by that? Well, an ordinary person would say a um, hundred years ago was a long time ago. A uh, hundred years ago, 1920, it was a long time ago. Warren Harding was president. Uh, the Great War had just ended. And the boom of the 1920s was occurring. That was not. That's not a long time to a geologist. A historian might say, going back 2,000 years is a long time, when Christ was walking the earth, and the Roman Empire was getting stronger, and Julius Caesar was stabbed outside the Senate by people who didn't want him to become a dictator. That's not a long time to a geologist. Ge uh, geologists work in millions or even billions of years. So we know the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. All the geochemical ev evidence indicates that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. And the astronomical evidence indicates that our universe is 13.7 billion years old. So geologic time is vast. Um, there's two ways in which we can date rocks. In other words, figure out how old rocks are. And let me write them down for you. We've got relative dating and we have absolute dating which is also called numerical dating okay so we've got two kinds of dating relative dating and absolute dating let's define what this means what does relative dating mean well on Thursday I'm going to invite uh, some of your relatives over to meet you and your cousin, oh, she looks good, man. Maybe you ought to ask her out. No, that's not what relative dating is. Relative dating means 
something is older than something else, or something is younger than something else. For example, you're younger than your parents. You are older than your children. The United States is older than Germany. Germany wasn't formed until 1871, and the U.S. was formed in 1776. Or China is older than France. Or I think you get the idea. So that's what relative dating is. Absolute dating, or otherwise known as numerical dating, is a number. You are 21 years old. The United States is 244 years old. Germany is 149 years old. It's a number. How do we figure out how old the rocks are numerically? Well, we do that using radioactive isotopes. And we're going to talk more about the person who discovered radioactivity a great scientist, one of my scientific heroes, Madame Marie Curie. Madame, c'est un mot français, en anglais, Madame et Mrs. In other words, Madame is Mrs. Marie Curie. She married, there's her husband, Pierre Curie. She's a French woman. Actually, she's not French. Her parents are from Poland, and they moved to France, and they became naturalized French citizens, and she married this French Frenchman, and that's why she has a French last name. But anyway, she discovered radioactivity about 1900, and her discovery of radioactivity would lead to an American scientist by the name of Ernest Rutherford. In 1907, he would he learned how to use Marie Curie's discovery of radioactivity to figure out how old rocks are. Ernest Rutherford. But before we get into the numerical dating more, let's first talk about relative dating. Relative dating is figuring out how old rocks are relative to one another. Which rocks are older and which rocks are younger? And it's based on James Hutton, who we talked about in chapter one, the father of modern day geology, and his theory of uniformitarianism. The present is the key to the past, and the earth is unimaginably old. This was discovered in the 1800s. So in order to do relative dating, uh, there, oh, there's a field of geology that where you use relative dating all the time, and it's called stratigraphy. Stratigraphy is the study of layered sedimentary rocks. Why do you, would you want to learn about layered sedimentary rocks? Well, for two reasons. The first is, if you want to figure out what happened in Earth's past, what's the history of the Earth, and how, how does the Earth work, you have to study stratigraphy. The, this stack of rocks here is pages in a book uh, telling you how the earth changed at this particular location with time. The rocks on the bottom are older than the rocks on top. Sedimentary rocks, you can tell they're all sedimentary because of the layers here, right? You don't see any dikes cutting through here or sills. You see rock, I could tell it's a limestone anyway. As you go up here, you get the younger and younger rocks. There are some basic principles of relative dating, and I'm going to make a list of them for you. The principles of relative dating. The first is the principle of superposition. Then we got the principle, uh, instead of writing principle, I'll, I'm just going to write, okay, principle 
of um, original horizontality. I, I'll just write it out for you. So, anyway, principle of I spelled it wrong. Tality. I think I could spell by now. Next one's called the principle. I'm just going to write this instead to save time. That means principle of lateral continuity. The next principle we need to know is the principle of cross-cutting relationships. And then we have the principle of inclusions. And then the, si the sixth principle of relative dating is the principle of fossil succession, which is also called the principle of biological succession. So I'll write that in here too. So there's six principles that we need to learn about. Think about it like this. Uh, you're not taking a geology class this summer and trying to get a good grade. You're a geologist. Put yourself in the geologist's shoes for a moment. You're you're in the geologist's shoes, and you and your employer wants you to figure out how old the various rocks are in an outcrop. That means an exposure of rock that is visible at the side of a road. You've got six tools to use. And these are the six principles of relative dating. Don't need any fancy equipment to do it. You just need your mind and a geologic hammer. And maybe a measuring tape. And you go and drive your vehicle. And you get out of your vehicle and you look at this 150 foot tall stack of sedimentary rocks. And you want to figure out how old are rocks in this exposure that you see along the side of a road. You can use six different principles. You need to learn this because next week the you're after the quiz this week we're gonna have a, a, the first lab on geologic dating and you're gonna use these six principles of relative dating. Let me first start off by saying that all of these principles of relative dating came from two people, James Hutton and Nicholas Steno. He was a Dane from Denmark. The, the last principle, the principle of fossil succession, we'll talk about it last, came from a man named William Smith. Actually, we should call him Sir William Smith. So you know where he's from. He was knighted by the king. We shall call him Sir William Smith because he's not a peasant. No, he's of the upper class. The king has knighted Sir William Smith. James Hutton, Nicholas Denno came up with these five principles. Let's talk about the principle of superposition first. Principle of superposition is simple, ladies and gentlemen. You, you can memorize it, but just understand it. It's easier. If you have a stack of sedimentary rocks like you have here, the sedimentary rocks on the bottom are older than the ones above it. That, it's that simple. It's like, okay, if you're interested in this stack of rocks, this is chapter one, this is chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, and you work your way up to younger and younger times. Principle of superposition only works for sedimentary rocks. But if you're just looking at bed, sedimentary beds, the beds on the bottom are older than those above it. That makes absolute sense. If you had a sedimentary bed deposited, like, let's say it's sandstone, and there's a siltstone on top of it, the sandstone had to be deposited to form a surface upon which the siltstone can be deposited on top of it, right? Okay, very good. We got that one down. Next one's the principle of original horizontality. Principle of original horizontality states 
that when sedimentary beds are deposited, they are originally deposited horizontal, not at an angle, not at an angle, but they're deposited flat. Why is that important? Why, and first of all, how do we know that? Well, the reason why we know that because sediments deposit on the bottom of the sea floor or on the bottom of a lake or almost all the dep depositional environments, almost all, are deposited horizontal. We know that because as we see it today. And the principle of uniformitarianism suggests that that's the way it occurred in the past as well. Let's use the principle of original horizontality for a moment. Let's take a look at these sedimentary beds. They're not horizontal, right? So what does the principle of original horizontality tell us? Tell us? Well, it tells us these beds were originally horizontal, and then later on an earthquake occurred and tilted those rocks. So we know from the principle of original horizontality, these beds were not deposited tilted like this. But instead of using the word tilted, uh, geologists use the word dipping. So these sedimentary dipping sedimentary beds were not deposited like this. They were first deposited horizontal, with this being the oldest and this being the youngest, according to the principle of superposition. And then they were tilted by an earthquake. Here's another... Um, Let's take a look at set these kinds of sedimentary rocks, very common in eastern Tennessee. Look at these sedimentary beds. They're folded. They're folded. i got to get a little prop here to show you this. Ge geologists see this, and they know what happened. These beds were first deposited horizontal. Then they were compressed. In other words, they were pushed together and folded. They weren't deposited folded. They were first deposited horizontal, and then they were pushed together, like at a convergent plate boundary, and they were folded. So we can use this over and over again, the principle of original horizontality. Next principle is called the principle of lateral continuity. Principle of lateral continuity. Now, let's imagine for a moment that you're standing right here on this grass on top of this sedimentary bed. And you look down and you see three other sedimentary beds. Automatically, you know that this is the youngest one and this is the oldest, right? Now, let's say your friend, she's standing over here on this other hilltop and between the two of you is a valley your friend she looks down and she sees same thing same exact beds as you have over here let's say this is sandstone and this is a coal bed another sandstone and then a conglomerate well you've got the same exact thing over here same exact color of rocks same uh, texture uh, every the same minerals well, what has happened to these four beds between these two locations? They've been eroded away. And we know that because of the principle of lateral continuity, which states that if uh, you, at one location you have sedimentary beds and you have the same sedimentary beds at another location and the rocks in between are missing, they were once connected together. They were once continuous. They were once laterally, laterally continuous, and then in the in-between area, they were eroded away. That's the third tool we have, a very valuable tool, the principle of lateral continuity. Fourth principle is called the principle of cross-cutting relationships. Let's take a look here. I tell you, I already know that this is a limestone here. But look what this is. This is basalt, an aphanitic igneous rock. This is a dike cutting through the limestone. Principle of cross-cutting relationship states that the geological feature that does the cutting 
must be younger than the rock that is cut. So what is which one is older, the limestone or the basaltic dike? The basaltic dike must be younger because the limestone was first deposited probably in the shallow ocean and then later on this dike cut through it. Let me give you another example of how we can use the principle of cross-cutting relationship. Here you have sedimentary beds one, two, and three. I can tell this is a breccia. This is probably a siltstone, and maybe this is a dolomite. Same thing on the other side. Then you have this crack. Can you see that this side has moved down and this side has moved up? Right? This side has moved down and this side has moved up. And therefore, this must be a fault. An earthquake occurred and forcing this side down and this side up. Let me ask you a question. According to the principle of cross cutting relationships, which is older, these three sedimentary beds or the fault? The fault must be younger because these three beds had to be there in the first place in order to be cut by this fault, which formed from an earthquake, which occurred after the deposition of these three beds. Also, the principle of superposition tells us this bed is older than that bed, which is older than this bed. Principle of cross-cutting relationship. Whatever does the cutting must be younger than what is cut. And we'll stop for there and we'll talk more about in the next video.